It is a pleasure to give uh, uh, this, this talk, uh, this graduate uh, course of BGS Math. Um, as you know, these are 11 sessions, two hours. And um, the idea of the course is to um, mainly work on two different things. The first one is try to explain um, different approaches, mathematical and computational uh, models or tools that we have to investigate dynamical processes. Then um, the idea is that um, we may need to use these models to explain some uh, real data, experimental or field data, whatever. So in the, in the course, uh, we will be talking about this during all the time. We will be mixing a lot of things, but at the end, this is the aim of, of this course. Uh, I would like these uh, lectures to be as much interactive as possible. And if anybody of you have some comment, some question, uh, some suggestion, just feel free to interrupt me and to discuss because here for sure I, there are a lot of people that are also working on, on dynamical systems and modeling. And, and I think that we can have uh, interesting discussions. Actually, in the last session, we are planning to make like a round table and perhaps people can share their experiences in the, let's say, not easy process of mm, fitting um, data with dynamical models. So I will be more in involved in the part of mathematical modeling and computational modeling, and I will um, talk a little bit about dynamics because this is very important, it's very related. I will not enter into many technical details, uh, most of the things I will explain uh, have been part of my research career uh, over the last 20 years. And uh, if you want more details, I can give you the references and there you will have more uh, technical, rigorous mathematical analysis. Okay, So my lectures will be quite basic. I mean, mm, very easy to follow. And uh, then um, we will also include, especially Luis Alzada, uh, different methods or different techniques that we have for data fitting. Because when we have a, a, a data set, dynamics, dynamical data set, uh, one has to have in mind some ideas or some intuitions that may, let's say, allow to choose the most suitable model or the most suitable tool to explain this data. Okay. Uh, since I, uh, I have been working in, in mathematical biology, I will uh, provide a lot of examples in biology and always trying to discuss what are the advantages or disadvantages or the assumptions that the different tools or the different models have. And this is important because we can model a dynamical system with many different approaches. And probably for some situation, it is better to use a reaction diffusion system or for other um, cases, it is better to use uh, a map. Then we will, we will have a session by Mark Jorba Cusco that will uh, explain algorithms for the integration of ODEs, because in many times we will first have to define the mathematical model. And then we will, uh, since most of these processes are nonlinear, we will need to solve the equations numerically and seek for those parameters that provide the better fit, the best fitting of the data. And it is also important to have some um, knowledge or some tools, uh, because of course there are a lot of integration methods and some of them are better for a particular case or some of, of or others are, are probably not very uh, suitable. Then we will go on with the um, different deterministic and heuristic optimization methods, because at least when we have to fit the data, this is a, a process of optimization. So we have the data, we have the predictions of the model, and we want to uh, optimize the distance, some kind of distance between the simulated data and the real data. And this is a, an optimization process. And Luis have a very strong expertise in optimization processes. Then in, a, in, a, in session in November, I will focus on a specific uh, heuristic algorithm for data fitting that is called macroevolutionary algorithm. 
that it's a kind of genetic algorithm, but takes into account uh, macroevolution. So it takes into account massive extinctions of parameters that are not good. Okay. Okay, so uh, I, again, if you have some comments on question, please interrupt because if I if I am here talking during two hours, perhaps it will be a little bit boring. Okay. Okay, so this course starts and is inspired uh, by four years of work that started in 2019 that ha we have been working on this data. This is ecological data. This is the population of uh, colonial bird that inhabits in um, Delta de Lebra, in the south of Catalonia. And this is a uh, quite long ecological time series because in ecology is very difficult to get very long data. I mean, 20, 30, 40, 100 years is very difficult. And uh, some colleagues in a center that it's in Blanes, they have been monitoring uh, in Delta de Lebra the population of these birds since 1981. So, and they are still doing, doing it. So we have like 40 something years of data. So I will just explain a little bit the, the things that we know that happened during this period. Um, and the idea is that these people came to us with this data and they say, we have a hypothesis. We have a hypothesis of, of why this population suffered this collapse. In almost 12 years, the population went from very large numbers to almost very few individuals. And they, they said to us, this is a social species. And this species established in 1981 in a Punta de la Baña, Delta de Lebra, which is a very suitable habitat because it's very stable. There are a lot of resources. This is a, 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 nat a natural park and it's protected. So the, uh, these birds start establishing in this patch. Okay, because this is, as I will explain now, is a metapopulation system. So here the population start increasing by reproduction and some processes of immigration start increasing a lot. And in 1997, few predators invaded the patch. So there was a perturbation. Since then, there was kind of decrease of the population because many of these birds were living to other patches because these guys were like four or five animals, not more. So this decrease cannot be explained by predation. Okay. And then after like a, a, a big peak that was mm, due to em environmental and, and, and nutrient input it was a, a very large increase in the population, but since this year to, let's say, 2017, the population almost collapsed. So all the birds were living of this place. Uh, it's interesting to see that this species is very sensitive to the perturbations because in 2017, the predators were removed from the patch. They were taken by the people from the park and were removed. And then the population of birds start, started again to colonize this patch of a study. So the first thing, when you, when you see a kind of this time series, it's okay. Um, what kind of model can we use to model the system? We have the, we have the hypothesis that this behavior, especially here, was because of a phenomenon that it's called social copying. So, if I am a bird that I am happily living in some place with a lot of other birds, but then because of the predators that are going uh, uh, around, uh, they are eroding like the ecosystem and birds start leaving the place because these birds do not have defenses to fight against uh, this predator. So they just have to live. They have the nests here and they start leaving the, the patch. But at some point, there was like the, a very fast acceleration. And the idea is that the birds are seeing that the populations are going away. And then they try to copy this. This is probably an um, evolutionary mechanism. Okay, and This was our, our hypothesis. So we had to do a mathematical model that may be suitable for this data 
And we had, in some sense, to model this phenomenon of social copying. You can imagine that it will depend on the density of the individuals. But as a difference from the exponential um, dispersal that usually take the models, that they say uh, you have equation and you have a term minus delta x. And this is the individuals that are going out. This is exponential dispersal. But this dispersal is the more individuals I have, the more we live. But this is the other way around. The less individuals there are, the more prone I will be to live. Okay. So what should we use here? Time continuous model, discrete continuous model. This is a population of birds. Uh, this is, uh, well, this is a species. Uh, just let, give me you some details. This is a Punta de la Baña, Delta de la Hebra. They were placed here in 1981. They arrived and, and there they had a lot of resources for growing. Uh, this is a marine coastal bird. It's mainly uh, indigenous species from the Mediterranean, North Atlantic, and South of, of Portugal. And this is a social species. Okay? It's a very social species. So they form colonies. This is the distribution. And this is something I will, I will explain. This is called a metapopulation. A metapopulation is a population of uh, species that is fragmented. It's in different patches. So they are not physically connected, but they are close enough to, uh, to be connected by processes of dispersal or colonization. Okay? So here you can see two things. So the, this is the site of study. Uh, and the red dots was the distribution of this species until 1997, when the predators invaded the patch of La Baña. And here we had the, the, the larger amount of population. So in 1996, the species was distributed in the red dots. When predators invaded this place and individuals start living, then they were replacing or, or they, they were colonizing the places in, in green. And here you have the uh, total population in all the patches. Okay, So we, we, the population went up to 20,000 individuals. Uh, very large population numbers. This is why we used uh, an ODE, a deterministic system because populations are large, so in principle, noise uh, is not important, okay? But this is an assumption, this is an assumption. Okay, so this is the, the, the dynamics, as I explained. These are the, the percentage of the total world population. So in 2006, the 73% of the whole population in the world was in La Baña. And this is how it has evolved. So this is a challenge for a modeler. Uh, we have quite a lot of points because this is an ecological time series. This is a, a 42 uh, years long time series, which is a very good uh, time window. And here, of course, we have different phases. We have different dynamics. So what we thought is to do a model, a single model, um, describing the time change of the population of birds, but in some sense, being able to consider this perturbation. And this perturbation, uh, as you will see during these days, and Luis will also uh, talk about this, um, this work, because here we did modeling, we did statistics, we did parameter fitting, we did everything we can do in a scientific uh, research uh, uh, project. And you will see that uh, we use a function to model this social copying effect. The less individuals, the more prone I will be to live. Okay, this is, the idea is very simple. For the initial phase, if you have some experience in modeling or in dynamics, you will, the first thing we said is this is exponential growth. This is exponential growth. And probably here, the population is starting arriving to the saturation, carrying capacity or something below the carrying capacity. So you will see what we did. And uh, just for you to see, uh, the first 
uh, the first part of the dynamics that it's be, uh, just before the entry of the predators, we just fit a logistic function. Very simple equation. I will show it later. Uh, and uh, these are the parameters that we have. And well, this is not here, but epsilon is the is the death rate of the birds that we have actually the data estimated from the directly from the from the data, and then we estimated the intrinsic growth rate, this competition beta that is related with the competition between the birds. And here we use a deterministic algorithm that it's called levenberg marquardt that Luis will explain. And we were able to do a very good fitting. From this fitting, we could mainly compute two interesting things. We were able to compute the carrying capacity of the system, which is here. And the population was not at all close to the carrying capacity when the predators entered. And the equilibrium, the predicted equilibrium. So, hmm. that the, the place is able to sustain because of the resources, the space. Yeah. Yes, this is the. the so, here in principle, if this follows a logistic uh, dynamics and we do not have this uh, entry of predators, this would. Well, not for this case because we have decay. So, if you have the logistic equation without decay, you, will, you you go to the current capacity, okay? Because it's an equilibrium point. But if you have some decay, you go a little bit lower. That is this value here. But this is the population that the system is able to, sus to sustain. So in principle, imagine that we do not have death. If the population increases over the current capacity, uh, it will start decreasing because there are not resources and the, the, the individuals will start uh, decreasing. Of course, the most interesting part is this one. Uh, you will see it in, in the other sessions. Uh, but with a, with a quite simple model, we were able to provide a good fit of all these time points. And thanks to the mathematical model, and you will see uh, in the next sessions, we were able to obtain uh, the response of this population as a function of the density the dispersal response. So how dispersal, how these birds live as the population decreases. And we have a very nice function that was only possible to obtain with the model. Without the model, we, we would not have been able to, to see how these, po these populations respond to um, the individuals that are living. Okay, good. So this is a, a first introduction of the motivation of this course. So I was like four or five years discussing with Luis and with the people in Blanas and with some other collaborators uh, because the, uh, you have to start with some model. So you have to start with a model. Probably you will need to modify this model because it's, it's missing things and you, you, are, you are refining the model. And finally, we were able to explain these 40 something years of dynamics that was all the dynamics that you have seen in this plot. These are transients. Here we do not have any kind of equilibrium. These are transients. So this is a logistic equation. Then you have the perturbation. Then the model changes. We have a transient and then we have also a transient. And it is very important to differentiate between transients and equilibrium, Equilibri equilibria. Okay, and this is something that we will also discuss. So today, uh, this is the first section. Mm, here mainly, I will I will talk about modeling, how to do a model, how can we do a model, uh, some tips and tricks that we can uh, use for building a dynamical model, and also it is very important to give some insights into the dynamics. Because it's not the same if you use continuous time than discrete time. It's very different. The dynamics is completely different. And this is something that is very important. Uh, then, uh, well, more or less, all these things will be mixed. Uh, I will kind of provide a list of different mathematical and computational tools that we can use. Many times, they are not exclusive. I mean, as you, as you will see, 
we can study a spatial extended system with a differential equation in which we do not have a space. We can study the system because the interactions are the same except the space. And these mean field models that I will explain in a few minutes, they can give us a lot of information. Why? Because we have a mathematical model, we have an equation, and we can, we can, we can do analytical things, we can do numerical things, and we can see, for example, in a spatial system that you have a first order phase transition, that you have a discontinuous jump, thanks to the mean field models, we can see that this is a sudden node bifurcation. And actually, it is a sudden node bifurcation. Okay? So I will uh, provide a lot of examples, explain the types of models, of course, the assumptions and limitations. These are models. Reality is very far away from the models. But we can try to go there. Then I will give a lot of examples, mainly the models that I have been working on, metapopulation models, like this one of the, of the birds, cellular automata, couplet map lattices, and then agent-based models, or individual-based models uh, in silico evolution. This is something that is very useful to study evolutionary processes. Okay, at the end of these two sessions, I will provide like two examples of how can we try to explain or understand a dy dynamical data. One is qualitative approximation. That is, I have some samples of some patients. Some of these patients have been infected by a virus and some of them have a larger diversity of, of viral uh, genomes. And the other don't have a so large diversity. And ones are curing and the others not. And I have a measure of entropy of this diversity of the patients in one group. And I have diversity measures of the, of the patients, of the, of the virus that they have inside the body, uh, have also uh, entropy measures. And I do a model and I explain these things that I have observed with, a, with the model. I, I see the same in terms of entropy, variance, diversity, whatever. Okay, and I will give an example of this with uh, hepatitis C virus. And then we have the quantitative approaches that are the approaches that this course is more devo devoted to. Because this is a quantitative modeling in which we will have a dynamical model with parameters and we will provide those values of the parameters that give the best fit to the data. And this is a quantitative model or a quantitative approach. And finally, 22 November, I will explain about these microevolutionary algorithms, which I have used quite a lot of times. Uh, and I will show there is some theory uh, behind these, these uh, algorithms and, and the applications. These algorithms are, are, are very easy to program, are, are, are easy to program. I mean, the, the, the problem is that then you have to run a lot of simulations, you have to make a lot of iterations to optimize the parameters. And uh, perhaps this method is not very useful if you have, I don't know, a system that is very smooth and you have two parameters. Then probably you will have to go for a Levenber Marquardt or a gradient descent or whatever. Okay. Good. So let me start with two quotations. One is from John Henry Holland, uh, one of the fathers of complex system science and uh, a very uh, a monster in the field of nonlinear dynamics and father of the genetic algorithms. So the contributions of Holland have been very, very important. And he said, model building is the art of selecting those aspects of a process that are relevant to the question being asked. As with any art, the selection is guided by taste, elegance, and metaphor. It is a matter of induction rather than deduction. And Hike depends um, Hike science depends on this art. Okay. Doing a model is an art, and this is true. And when you start uh, doing models, you, you are very loose. You are completely lost because you don't know how to start, what to do, what to... But uh, I will give then later some tips and tips and, and tips to tricks and tips to, to do the models. Uh, but this is really, you need to have a very good knowledge of the system that you are studying. 
Why? Because some of the processes will be relevant and others not. And this is dependent on the question that you are doing, because depending on what you are asking, you may use a model or another. Another quotation that has influenced me a lot, and the first time I saw it, I, I was completely uh, excited, is uh, this one by Robert MacArthur. Scientists are perennially aware that it is best not to trust theory until it is confirmed by evidence. This is the empirical paradig paradigm of science. If I cannot see experiments, I, I don't believe it. But it is equally true, and equally true, that it is best not to put too much faith in facts until they have been confirmed by theory. Okay, This is a very, very interesting um, quotation. And actually, science now is very interested in providing the empirical evidence and the theory at the same time. If you do it for a very spectacular system, you will probably publish a nature paper or a science paper. Okay, If you are only dealing with the theory, you will publish a journal of theoretical biology, which is a, a very good journal. Okay. okay, very general classification of systems and models to study them. This is a very naive thing, very simple thing, but it is very important. So I would differentiate between well-mixed systems uh, and special extended systems. So these well-mixed systems is what we can also call mean field models or mean field theory. Or you will also see that this is a system that is in the limit of infinite diffusion. Everything is perfectly mixed. Special correlations do not matter. There are systems in the world that uh, it, this, is, this is true. If you are studying a population of bacteria growing in a test tube, you can assume that this is well mixed. But of course, many of the systems that we have here in, in nature or in physics or in chemistry, they are spatially extended. Okay, And then uh, on top of these two kind of systems, different systems, we have if they are deterministic or they are stochastic. Of course, everything is stochastic, or almost everything is stochastic. But sometimes the deterministic approach, in which there is no noise, we have the initial condition, the laws of evolution, and the parameters, and we can say the state of the system. We do not have external sources of noise, or intrinsic noise due to demographic fluctuations. But depending on the system, probably we can say something using a deterministic approach, but we have then to move to the stochastic description because there is noise. So for the case of the birds, since the population was, was so large, the sources of noise were like negligible because we didn't have demographic noise when you have low population numbers. And this is why we use an dif uh, ordinary differential equation. Okay, so a spatial model, very simple. We have that the state of the system in the cell IJ in time depends on its state and in some neighborhood. We have spatial correlations, we have local rules, we have local interactions. Okay. We have this neighborhood, which is the von Neumann neighborhood for nearest neighbors, but we can have many other neighborhoods. We can have eight nearest neighbors, or we can have a neighborhood of two uh, uh, slides, the, the uh, closer neighbors and the others surrounding th them. So this is something that we can choose. And always, always that we have a spatial model, we can make the mean field model of the spatial model. Why? Breaking the correlations. So if we break the correlations and the state of AJ depends on the states of any of the other places, or let's say better, on an average system, this is a mean field model. The state at time t changes interacting with an average system, omega. And this is a very powerful approach. And when we have an ordinary differential equation with some interactions, 
we do not have space. We are assuming that X just changes as a, as a function of X or other variables. And this is the mean field approach. And as I said, we can study both. We can study both. And usually, uh, the fundamental mechanisms when you have a special process uh, in terms of phase transitions, bifurcations, uh, transients, the mean field model gives a lot of information. But it, it is true that space can introduce novel phenomena. And it is something that have, has been very, very well studied in physics. Physics have been doing everything mm, since, I don't know, the 70s. They have been finding every kind of dynamical process, uh, uh, bifurcations, chaos in a lot of experiments in, in, in convection, in fluid dynamics, in uh, electronics, in optics, in lasers, in everything. Everything is described in physics. But in biology, this is starting now. Now we are starting to find things that we know from dynamical systems in the in the real system. And I will I will show you some examples. So again, if I have a system, I can do this, I can analyze the system and then analyze this system and look for the differences because there are differences. Space introduces differences. And we will see also some examples. So special models. Now I will give a list of different models. Most of the metapopulation models. Metapopulations, as I said, is a system where you have the population distributed in different patches that are separated physically but are connected by processes of dispersal or colonization. Okay. Most of them, because the classic, the classic uh, metapopulation model is a mean field model. Because we can also consider a space explicit, implicitly, sorry, implicitly. Okay. Then, of course, we have cellular automata models on lattice models. It's a model that we have a grid of cells, we have a discrete variables, we have neighbors, and the evolution, the time evolution of the system depends on some neighborhood. So special correlations matter. Then we have a kind of continuous discrete um, system that are uh, the couplet map lattices, which have been mainly used to study spatiotemporal chaos, but mm, they have not been very used in in uh, in ecology or this. So this these articles or this this uh, research is is not very 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 extended. In the eighties, it was quite quite interesting. And then of course we have the reaction diffusion models with the PDEs the so-called off-lattice models, in which we have kind of a spatial structure, but we do not have like a discrete interaction with the neighbors. We, we have some distances and some potentials, for example, and particles uh, move according to this. And also Gillespie, which is a, a, an algorithm to uh, simulate uh, chemical reactions or interactions with noise. And you can also use it in, in, a, in a grid. And then we have the, the mean field models, some, some metapopulation models as well, uh, Asian-based models. For example, uh, a well-mixed system in which I have uh, digital genomes. I have bit strings that replicate, mutate, whatever. And uh, these are the so-called Asian-based or individual-based models, which can be, of course, also uh, studied with space. Then we have the differential equations, uh, autonomous differential equations, non-autonomous differential equations, and um, I mean, diff different types of differential equations. And then we have also the piecewise systems, the, the maps, different equations, and also the LSP simulations, okay? So, first example, very simple. I want to model the transcription of a messenger RNA. So I have a genome with a gene, and this gene is transcribed, given to a uh, messenger RNA. And then this messenger RNA is degraded. OK, very easy. We have the DNA, which is there in the cell, the nucleus. 
And there we have these transcription processes, this mRNA that is degrading. Just this. Then, of course, this RNA can be translated. We can have the production of proteins that can interact with the DNA or with the uh, RNA, whatever. And I tell you, OK, do a model uh, of this system. So we have to assume some things, because we are going to do a model. We assume that our RNA is produced at a constant rate from the DNA. So this is a constitutive synthesis. And it is degraded exponentially, decays exponentially. OK. What we need to do? So first of all, the first thing that we have to do is to identify the so-called state variables that are the variables that change in time. These are the variables of, of the system. That will be the dimension of the system, of the dynamical system. And then identify the processes and the parameters. How many variables would you use here? Taking, on taking into account what I said. Any volunteer? One. Why? Yeah, because because the DNA is there. It's it's not it's not it's not changing in time and it's producing the RNA. So the production is constant. Okay. So one variable, state variable. X, the concentration of um, uh, messenger RNA. And the parameters, we have this transcription rate, which is constant, mu, and the degradation, epsilon. OK, so let's write the model. The change in time of the RNA, x dot, which is the same that the differential equation, it's mu, the production, minus the degradation, which is exponential. This is a linear system, and we can obtain an analytical closed solution. We can integrate by separation of variables, and we obtain the uh, explicitly a mathematical form for the value of x. So if we know the, the initial condition, and we know the values of the parameters, I can tell you the value of the population for any time. This is a deterministic system. Mm, no problem. Good. When we do these calculations, uh, we can go or, or, or we obtain two cases. The first case is what happens at t0. This is also a way to see if you have done the integral correctly. When t0, This is, uh, so this goes, you have to obtain when t is 0, you have to obtain that x at time 0 is the initial condition. OK? This is 1, this cancels, and you get x0. Perfect. And when t goes to infinity, the limit of this going t to infinity, this is 0, and then this cancels, and you have mu divided by epsilon. And this is the state of the system when t goes to infinity. What is this, exactly? What is saying me this, assuming t goes to infinity? This is an equilibrium point of the system. So if I take the differential equation and I compute the equilibrium, the equilibrium points, I equal it to 0, then I, got, I, I, I obtain this. And if you do linear stability analysis of this model, you will see that the derivative of the function is minus epsilon. So this equilibrium is stable. So this is the dynamics, very simple. It's a linear sim system that grows. If the initial condition is below this equilibrium point, which is stable because the, the, the derivative of the function is minus epsilon, and we know that the local stability is attracting, then we will go to this equilibrium. OK, another thing is then if we do an experiment and we observe this. This is another thing, OK? But with this kind of systems, we have a lot of information. Of course, many of the processes that happen or that, or that take place in nature are nonlinear, and we cannot obtain the analytical solution. Most of them, it's impossible. But then we have other techniques. As you know, we have 
um, equilibrium points, we have stability analysis, we also have uh, numerical, numerical methods. Okay, this is a very simple model, just um, for you to see more or less uh, what you have to take into account. But, okay, so details that are important when we have to decide or to design a model. First, should we use spatial extended system or non-spatial dynamics, mean field model? Does the space introduce new phenom phenomenology into the dynamics? It depends. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And it depends mainly uh, on the interactions. So for example, if we have a system that is, that I will explain it now, that you have a system of molecules that catalyze the replication, the replication of other molecules. So we have a catalytic system. And you have catalysis, competition, and decay. Then the mean field model and the spatial system is very similar. The only thing is that the space can change a little bit the values of the probabilities of, hap of the events happening, the critical values of these probabilities or these rates that make the system to survive or not. This can change a little bit because in the spatial system, we have diffusion. And diffusion will uh, influence the velocity at which reactions take place. But if we are studying a prey-predator system if, and we have a space, then it's very different. Because since we have a space, uh, we can have the emergence of uh, spatiotemporal phenomena, and we can have emergence of patterns. And a lot of works with predatory, predator prey systems or other types of systems, you see that there is a kind of self-organization of the system and appear structures. And these structures can involve that uh, predators cannot invade the whole population. For example, okay. So they introduce new phenomenology, but interactions are very important. So the nature of time: should we use continuous or discrete time? This is also a very difficult question because if we are modeling a chemical reaction, for example, time should be continuous. If we are modeling, uh, for example, an experiment with viruses that we are doing passages of viruses in, in, in cell cultures, then we will at some point use a discrete approach or combine time continuous with discrete events. Okay. And you know, from dynamical systems theory, we see that the nature of time is very important because if we are in continuous time, we know and we have theorems like the poincare bendixson theorem that says that when you have two variables, the most complicated dynamics that we can have are self-sustained oscillations, limit cycle. We cannot have chaos in, 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 in two variables, with two variables. But if the system is discrete with a single variable, we can have chaos. The, the logistic map, very clear. Okay, the number of state variables, that is the dimension of the system in terms of dynamical systems theory. So do you think that if I do a very detailed model, for example, uh, for the life cycle of a virus, so you have a virus that infects the cell and then the virus synthesize the proteins and then the proteins make the copies of the genomes and then the other proteins encapsulate the viruses. So do you think that to understand this thing, I need to use 10 variables, one for the RNA of the of positive sense, another RNA for the negative sense, another for the proteins, another for the ribosomes, another for the polymerase, another for the code protein, or perhaps with two equations, it's enough. One may think that the more variables the system has, the better the description of the system will be. I think this is true. But it doesn't mean that we can study this system with two equations, for example. And some works that we have done, we have done the two different models, the one very simplified, very abstract, very simple, and the one with all the equations, and at the end, what you see is the same, the same dynamics, exactly the same, and the same bifurcations. 
But of course, it is something that you have to decide. Why? Because if you have a model with a lot of variables, you will, you will be um, studying a lot of processes, but you will have a lot of parameters as well. And then what do you do? When we have six parameters, we cannot do analytical things. We have just to fix parameters and numerically see, try to identify things. So uh, the, another one is the nature of the interactions between the, the agents or between what, whatever is involved in the dynamics. This is very important because um, it's not the same to consider that I don't know, for example, in the in the prey predator model, the Lotka Volterra model that considers that the predators reproduce proportionally to the amount of preys. So the more preys, the more reproduction of predators. This is not realistic. Because at, there is some point that the predator, there are so many preys that it cannot eat everything because uh, he, he will have to, to ha handle and manipulate the prey. He will need some time to search for the prey. At some point, he will not be more hungry. So this, this is very... Uh, uh, and, and of course, the, the terms that we use, the, 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 the mathematical terms that we use to model the interactions can be different. We can have saturation or not. We can have uh, cooper cooperation or not. We can have competition, then the interactions change. Okay? And of course, it impacts on the dynamics. And then another important thing is uh, the impact of the spatial dimensions, because, for example, I can study a spatial system considering a one dimension, considering a ring, or I can study the system considering a two dimensional space or a three dimensional space. If I want to model the growth of a tumor, it is better to use a three-dimensional space. If I want to model how a virus spreads on a plant leaf, then with a 2D system, with a surface system, it's enough. And sometimes there are some works that have been interested in the changes that happen when you have two or three dimensions. I mean, can a two-dimensional system uh, exp uh, explain things and does the 3D system it's very different from the 2D and it depends on the interactions in general uh, when you have a, a, spa a spatial system with two dimensions you, you, you can gather a lot of things of the dynamics I mean sometimes then you add a third dimension and things do not change but you have to check of course and if you use uh, 3D systems, then this is computationally very, very costly. Uh, and also then noise. It's very important because if the dynamics is very noisy, you can have noise-induced phenomena. You can have noise-induced bifurcations. You can have some variables changing the buzzing of attraction because of noise. And this is something that uh, now it's it's very it's being very studied in terms of epigenetics, cancer, ecology, a lot of things. Okay, but again, here, if you have the deterministic description of the system, then you will probably see or you will probably know that this jump because of the noise is because you have uh, two stable points and you have two basins of attraction. And if you have a good deterministic description, you will be, be able you will be able to understand the phenomenology behind what happens with noise. Okay. So this is a, a very nice table that uh, you can find in the book of Strogatz, Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos. It's a classification on nonlinear systems according to the number of variables uh, that you have to use to describe these systems with ordinary differential equations. So when you have one variable, you have also, you have, of course, um, a phenomenon of growth and decay. Uh, you cannot have oscillations. And here, what we have is we have fixed points, we have bifurcations, uh, the logistic model, uh, chemical equilibrium, symmetry breaking, okay? And then as we move to the right and we increase dimensions, 
all the behaviors that are in the previous dimension conserve in the new one, but we have new phenomena. For example, with N2, we have oscillations. We can have sustained oscillations, deterministic oscillations. We have the pendulum, we have limit cycles. We have the two patch metapopulations or predator prey systems. For this case, the Lotka Volterra predator prey model, you have these centers with these dynamics with centers. And then when the number of variables is equal or three, uh, sorry, equal or larger than three, then we have com dynamical complexity in pure state. That is chaos. Okay. We have strange attractors, chemical kinetics, fractals, quantum chaos. Then when we have a lot of variables, this is what we call collect collective phenomena. The Josephson arrays, uh, lasers, immune system, artificial protocell. Well, this is something I, I included here because this is a modified from Strogatz. Economics, ecosystems. And when we have infinite dimensions, special extended systems, we have waves and patterns. And we have solitons, plasmas, earthquakes, epilepsy, ecosystems. And of course, life is here. So... This is a very nice classification in which we can identify the realm of complex systems. Taking into account that this is a classification that is based on the dynamics that we observe as a function of the dimensions of a system governed by differential equations. It's one possible classification of complex systems or identification of complex systems. Uh, in terms of dynamics, of course. Good. Received for building a model. So I have some experiments, some data of the experiments, and I am seated on my table and I say, I want to write a model. What can I do? First, draw a, dry, a diagram. Draw a diagram with the interactions, with the arrows, with the positive feedbacks, negative feedbacks, loops. And this is very useful to identify the variables, the parameters, and especially the interactions. This can be very trivial and a very stupid piece of information. But this is something I, I always do when I have to, to do a model. Okay? Many times it's also useful to write down what we call the chemical reactions, the stoichiometry. That is, to put the interactions in, in the notation of chemical kinetics. Uh, I1 plus I1 gives three I1s. This is autocatalysis. I1 plus I2 gives zero to I2. This is prey predator. Okay. Identify the nature and number of interactions because many times we will end up, we will have as many mathematical terms as interactions we have, and most of the models I will show you are polynomial mod models, okay? Identify relevant parameters. Identify if we have some very fast time scale for a variable that we can assume what we call the adiabatic uh, approach, and we can assume that that variable is at equilibrium because dynamics is very fast. Then we reduce the system one degree of freedom. So, so something like this, uh, are very important tricks that will help. And the most important thing is once I have done all these four points, I can use any kind of model. Probably, and this is something that we do in our research, is to study the same system with three different models. Why? Because we look for consistency. If I have a ODE for the model and I see a sudden node bifurcation, and then I do a cellular automata, and I see a first order phase transition, and then I do a metapopulation model, and I see a sudden node bifurcation, then I can say that the system has a sudden node bifurcation. Okay. Example two. This one is not so um, tri trivial, like, like the RNA one. And this is a model that I, I, I was studying in my PhD many years ago with uh, Ricard Soler. And we were interested, we were working in a project that aim, was aiming to build a synthetic protocell from scratch. And we were in charge of the modeling part. 
So we will we want to model a two species cross catalytic system that in the rea reality we, it could mimic the behavior of uh, ribozymes. So ribozymes are piece, pieces of RNA that have, of course, information because it's a sequence of RNA and also perform a function. So they are uh, they they can uh, do a lot of things. They can cut other RNAs. They can join different RNAs. So they have catalytic activity. So these guys here are like the candidates of the origins of life, okay? Because you have information and function. So this is the first figure of, of, the, of the paper, the diagram. I have two species system. I have two macromolecules, two different macromolecules. This is a replicator, but it can only replicate with the help of this one. So I1 is aiding and is catalyzing the replication of A2. And A2 is catalyzing the replication of A2. And this is a hypercycle. This is, a, this is a, very, a system, a model from the 70s that is related with the origin of life. And it's, it's very interesting. If anybody is interested, I can give uh, some literature. So how many variables here? Two. How many parameters? Well, at least two. That is this catalytic interaction. More things. This is a catalysis. We are assuming that I1 can only replicate when we have I2. So I1 with I2 cannot replicate. Then we do not have exponential growth. We will have catalytic growth. That is, the growth of I1 will depend on the amount of I2. Okay, And then we have also some decay, some degradation. So let's write down the chemical reactions, stoichiometry. The dynamics will be growth, the process of growth and decay. So this is the reaction. So we have I1 plus I2 plus some necessary building blocks that we are not considering explicitly. So these are like, let's say, if these are RNA sequences, these are like the nucleotides. But we are not considering. We should. We could consider, but we are not considering. We assume that S is very abundant, and then these molecules can be synthesized. And at the rate k, I two is making this guy to make a copy of itself. So we will have two I two plus sorry two I one plus I two. This is a chemical reaction, a stoichiometry, and this is the other the other. Um, species, I2. Here we are assuming that I2 has more fitness. This means that the replication rate is larger than K. And this is why here we put eta K of K. Because if eta K is one, then the two species replicate at the same rate. And we call this a symmetric hypercycle. But we are interested in a system with asymmetries that this guy can replicate better or replicates faster. So here it's the same. The replication of I2 depends on I1. And at this rate, we will have I1 plus 2 I2. And decay. Decay is very simple. I1 decays at some rate, um, giving ag again these, these building blocks, which are not considered. Okay, And I2. So now, and this is why it is important when we can write the chemical reactions, because translating these reactions to equations is very easy. We only need to take into account the law of mass action, the mass action law. This is a, a very important concept in chemistry. And this is what allows us to transform this reactions in equations. And actually, there is software that you put the reactions and gives you the equations. There are some so modeling softwares that do it. So the mass action law says that the rate of the chemical reaction, so the speed that this chemical reaction is happen happening in this direction, is directly proportional to the product of the activities or concentrations of the reactants. What does it mean? that the production of more I2 depends 
on the rate of production, but depends on the concentrations of, of these uh, reactants. And to model it and to put it into an equation, the, loss, the law of mass action says that uh, this reaction will be the result of the product of the two reactants and the rate. Okay, let's put an example. So this is how the population of I1 increases. This is the uh, rate of uh, synthesis of I1. So the rate of synthesis of A1 will be the product of these two concentrations here. And we need to put this product here. It's like they, I, I, I sometimes say it's like they have to meet, they have to collide, they have to coincide. And this is why we have this product here. And this product here, this term here is exactly this reaction transformed into a dynamical model. For the second species, it's the same, but now the rate of production of I2 will be the product of these two uh, reactants uh, that will produce this at, a, at this rate, at this constant rate, okay? So this is growth, okay. And then we have decay. Here, we only have that from I1, it degrades to some rate epsilon. This is exponential decay, minus epsilon, x1 minus, minus eta epsilon epsilon x2. And here, if you notice, we have included this term here. Why? Because these are ribozymes, these are um, RNA molecules that are in a system, are in a finite system with finite resources, and they cannot grow forever. And we need to bound the growth. And we use this function that you will probably identify, this is the logistic function, including the two species. So mainly the logistic function, what it's doing is that, uh, for example, for this case here, the amount of the same population for X1 is affecting the growth rate of this population. Why? Because of intraspecific competition. They are competing for resources. And the more, this is assuming that the more amount of X1, the uh, lower will be the, the, the increased rate because there will be competition. And this is inter-specific competition. Why? Because these two species are the same. They are two different ribozymes or two different molecules. And they are also competing between them. And this is a logistic function. With this function, we have the system bounded. So at the end, we have ended in a deterministic, time continuous, real value, two dimensional, nonlinear equations to study this system. Okay. So we identify the relevant parameters. Of course, we have the catalytic constants and the degradation rates. Here, sometimes you will see that we have also some parameters here that indicate the strength of the competition. So we can also model different competition strengths. Okay? Of course, these parameters need to be positive because if this term here, minus x1, becomes positive, then it is not competition, it's cooperation. Okay? So, Identify the best suitable dynamical system. This is the point five of this uh, very naive list. So we have chosen this system, system of ODEs. I could have chosen any other. This is my decision. And then, uh, well, of course, um, a system cannot grow forever. I have, I have explained the logistic-like constraint, but we also have uh, what we call constant population constraint that sometimes, depending on the system, is very useful. And I, give some, I will give some example or some exponential decay as the population increasing of some saturation functions. Holling functions, michaelis menten or Hill, that it will depend on the system. Okay, we have the model. Uh, this model is, is not possible to solve it analytically, 
So because it's a very highly nonlinear system. And what we can do, compute the equilibrium points. We co compute the values that make the two time derivatives equal to zero. And we see that there are three equilibrium points. OK. Uh, with the simple thing that is to solve um, uh, a quadratic polynomial, we see that one of the equilibrium points is the origin that will involve extinction. But then we have these two fixed points, gamma plus, gamma minus, which have this form. And here we can start seeing a lot of things. Here we have a square root. Uh, when this square root is 0, the two fixed points have the same value. What does it, what does it mean that they collide? When the discriminant is negative, this is a complex number. The fixed points are not in the phase space of the real numbers. They are in the complex phase space. So they collide and disappear. This is a saddle node bifurcation. So only having a look to the fixed points, I can see that this is a saddle node bifurcation. And it's possible analytically, but I didn't put it here because it's, it's a little bit tedious, to, to show that gamma plus is a stable node and gamma minus is a saddle point. OK. If we perform linear stability analysis and compute the eigenvalues uh, around the origin, we see, of course, this, this, uh, this is minus, minus epsilon and minus eta epsilon epsilon. Okay, they, they are negative. And we see that this is a locally, asymptotically stable equilibrium. OK, some plots. These are phase portraits. Phase portraits for this system obtained numerically. Here we have the symmetric hypercycle in which uh, these values eta, epsilon, and eta k are one. So the rates of synthesis and the degradations are the same for the two species. This is symmetric. The equilibrium points are placed in the, on the, dia in the diagonal. These are four different systems uh, increasing the degradation rate. So when the degradation rate is very low, the, the, the origin has a very small buzzing of attraction. And mainly all the initial conditions will go to this point here that is a, a stable node. If we increase epsilon, the buzzings of attraction, or let's say the saddle and the node moves, get closer, and the buzzing of attraction of the origin increases. And just at when this uh, square root is zero, these two equilibrium have collided and they disappear. And this is a sudden bifurcation. And the same for the asymmetric hypercycle. So if we make eta k that was multiplying k, we fix it to two. And eta epsilon that was multiplying the decay at 0 0.5, that is the second species replicates twice faster and decays twice uh, um, lower, this equilibrium point, of course, the change is the position, but the phenomenology is the same. I would like you to have a look to this plot here and to this plot here, especially this one. Can you see here something strange? So these two points, more or less collide here. Do you see what happens to the orbits starting here? They go to this place, and then they move forward. So for, tho for those who know, who know me, uh, you will probably have seen me sometime talking about ghosts. Um, may I uh, ask you a question? Yes. Um, I am the part participants online. Uh, probably you are showing with the lasers, but um, we are not able to see which picture you are talking about because um, the laser okay. doesn't work with the presentation. Okay, Could you please yeah. let us know which picture uh, yes. is that? Thank you. Yeah, so it's it's uh, the the it's B and D of the symmetric hypercycle. Okay, panel B and D. So in panel B we have the the 
stable node and the saddle that approach and in panel D they have collided and all the orbits go to zero but they they travel to the place where the collision took place here we cannot see what is happening but uh this is called a ghost okay and I have been in, doing research on this ghost since 2006. So we have done a lot of work because this is re related with transients. And now I will give more details. OK, so this is a bifurcation diagram that uh, we can actually we can obtain it numerically or analytically because we have the fixed points. So we, we can draw it whenever whenever we want. And here we have two cases, the symmetric case, k equal one, in which the sudden load bifurcation happens uh, at 0 0.125, okay? It's uh, k divided by eight. And when we have this asymmetric hypercycle that has more fitness, the bifurcation point uh, changes. And here in this place where you can see this ghost, when we are close to the bifurcation, but when the bifurcation just took place, here dynamics are very, very, very slow. And this is because of this ghost. So what is this ghost? It's very easy to understand this mechanism for maps. So here we have a map. This is a normal form for the sudden of bifurcation. Here at the left, we have the diagonal and we have two tangencies. So this is the stable point and the white one is the unstable one. And then as, as we move the parameter, this parabola crosses the diagonal. And just here at, at the intersection in the mid panel, this uh, red dot, this is when we have the saddle node bifurcation. And then the parabola gets away the diagonal. So there are no fixed points because the fixed points are the, the crossings of the function with the, with the diagonal. What happens when we are in this situation and if we iterate the system when the parabola is just below the diagonal, what we see is that we go to the function, diagonal, function, diagonal, function. And here, this is very narrow. And here, we need to do a lot of iterates. And then we escape. And this is what is causing this delay. And the same happens for differential equations, the same. This is, these results are very, are very uh, well known from dynamical systems theory. It is known that after the bifurcation, if we compute the time, the past time, the time that an orbit spends passing through this bottleneck as a function of phi, that is how far we are from the bifurcation, okay? Or say in other words, when phi tends to zero, we are approaching to the bifurcation value. And as phi increases, we are um sorry we are increasing the bifurcation parameter above the bifurcation value and what we know from dynamical system theory and it happens for a lot of bifurcations is that this time this passage time follows scaling laws and this one follows the inverse square root scaling law so the time i will use the blackboard but it's it's a very a very this time goes as uh, follows this law. Okay. For the transcritical bifurcation and the pitchfork bifurcation, we also have uh, this kind of scaling laws with different exponents. Okay, uh, the mechanisms are dif are different. Okay, this is this is math. This is actually we can we can obtain this uh, scaling law analytically from the normal form of, of the differential equation. This is a this is a like playing a game. Yes, that's true. But this law has been uh, found experimentally. So in this paper, 1998, they were studying the duffing oscillator with a circuit. And the dynamic of this model, of the model of this circuit, uh, gives two periodic orbits, one stable and one unstable. So this is the dynamics of the system. What they did, these guys, was 
by using a Poincaré section, they studied these uh, fixed points of the periodic orbit at the Poincaré section, uh, this bifurcation, this sudden node bifurcation of periodic orbits. But of course, in the Poincaré map are fixed points. And experimentally, they identified the parameters and computed these transient times that was by means of oscillations as a function of how the, the, the system was, dri was driven above the bifurcation. And they found this scaling law with uh, the experimental exponent is minus 0 0.52 and the theoretical is uh, minus one half. So th this, is, this is an example of that a mathematical model is explaining us the, the reality. And more interesting is that here, this is happening because we have like some equilibria that are in the complex numbers, because this is what the model is saying. And despite they are not in the real numbers, phase space, they are influencing the dynamics of, of the real system. And this is what is, is causing this delay. So this is probably one of the few examples that you can see with your eyes and you can measure an effect that is happening in the complex phases, in the complex numbers world. Okay. Well, this is a little bit metaphysics, but um, this is because these points have gone to the complex number phase space. This is why it's called a ghost, because there is nothing in the phase space. There is not anything, uh, but it is influencing the dynamics. This is why, why we call it a ghost. OK, this is another example. Uh, this is a paper, 10-year-old paper. And it's, I think, the most clear example of a representation of a bifurcation in uh, laboratory experiments. So this was a this is a group at MIT, and what they did is in uh, in cell cultures with yeast. Yeast is a unicellular organism that um, basically uh, synthesizes some enzymes outside. These enzymes outside. Uh, process the food and then they obtain energy. Okay, so uh, that is this is a highly density dependent process. So if there are a lot of cells, there will be a lot of enzymes outside and the, the food will be processed to obtain energy. But if there are very few, then the amount of energy that they will be able to obtain will be low. Okay, and this is related with the Ali effect. This is a very important thing in biology, the Ali effect that was invented by Professor Ali. The Ali effect is the relation between the fitness of a population and the size of the population. If the population is very large, they will not have any problem on obtaining energy because they collaborate. So the enzymes that this guy is, is throwing outside are converting the food into nutrients, and these nutrients probably will be taken also by, by, by this guy. So they are collaborating. And here they did a very simple experiment. This is a population density of cells. Okay, And here in the x-axis, you have the dilution factor. So they were growing the populations at different dilutions. So the lowest the dilution, the more number of cells they were playing with the population sizes. So here you have the, the these bars are the experimental data, okay? And the lines are the mathematical model. And what they saw is that if you start with large population numbers and you start diluting, then the population more or less starts decreasing. And at some point you have a tipping point a discontinuous extinction, catastrophic extinction. And these guys were very smart. And by playing with the uh, initial conditions, they were able to identify the unstable branch of the diagram. This means that experimentally, for example, at a dilution of 1,500, if they started with a population of 1,000 individuals, they go to extinction. But if we started with a population of 
uh, 10,000, then the population survived. And they did it experimentally. And the model also showed this unstable branch. And the so complicated, well, it's not complicated experiment, it's a very smart experiment. This thing here, this tipping point is, is you can explain it with this equation. This is why theory is so powerful. Okay. So now, I have talked a little bit about the, the two species hypercycle with ODEs. We have seen that we have a tipping point, we have a sudden bifurcation, we have three equilibrium points, we can see that one is stable, the other is not stable, etc. We have this scaling low for the system. This scaling low is you you always that you have a sudden bifurcation, you, you will have this scaling low, always. It's a universal phenomenon. Okay. So now, what happens if we put a space to this system? This is a system that can be either a system of ri ribozymes that will be probably interacting on a surface, or I can consider that they are two species that are co that are cooperating in an ecosystem. Then they will probably be sp in, in a space, in a physical space. Okay, so then we decided to study the systems with the space and also considering stochasticity because the, the differential equation was deterministic, no noise. Okay, so we, we decided, okay, what can we do? Okay, let's, because now we have to simulate the system. We don't have an equation. We have to make a simulation of the system. And we have to make a program with a computer uh, gathering these nonlinear interactions, this cooperation. How can we do that? Okay, so we decided, okay, we will study the system considering uh, using a cellular automata in one dimension, in a in a row, okay, that you can you can think in a in a in a in a capillar or in a porous uh, one dimensional system, and in a surface extended in a surface. The state variables two, the two different mo macromolecules. We have two agents, two different agents. The neighborhood of the automata. Well, it's the more neighborhood that it's it's the this one. We have uh, northwest, north, northeast, east, west, south. Uh, we have eight neighbors. The most difficult thing is to define the straight transition rules because I have to program it. I do not have I do not have equations here. I have to program. And then the boundary conditions. That is the boundary conditions when we have a special extended system is what happens if I, I am going outside the lattice, okay? We have the, the neighbors at the boundary and imagine that it moves here. We don't have uh, nothing. Well, well there, there are different ways to choose the boundary conditions. And here, what we did is to consider toroidal boundary condition, condition. So this one, you go here, okay? If we have square, and we join the, the sides and the sides, we have a, a torus, we have a toroidal space. Another thing that we, we can consider a barrier. There is a barrier here and they cannot move or they are reflected, depend, depending, okay. Okay, so here the most important thing is how can we model this catalytic, catalytic interaction? This is a density dependent process. So there are a lot of ways to do it. We, we, we use this one. This is for the one dimensional system. And we define three state transition rules. One of reaction and diffusion, okay? One of decay that actually these two were modeled with uh, ODE, but then we add diffusion, spatial diffusion. In the ODE, this spatial diffusion is infinite. So the first, here we consider that in a single cell, we could have none, one or two replicators. And we consider that the interaction produced when these two replicators were in the same cell. 
Here we could have I1, I2. So if they are different, they can interact. And then one of them will replicate. But for example, if we have I1 and I1 here, nothing happens. Okay. This is how we introduce density dependent. This guy here, if it wants to make a copy and move and, and, and put the daughter uh, molecule, needs to be or needs to interact with the other one. And this is what, with the law of mass action, was the KX1, X2. The same for the 2D system. Here we have a reaction. So we have, for example, in the center cell, we say if we have I1 and we have I2, then with some probability, you make a copy of A2. And you put it in an um, empty neighbor. Okay. Then the other reaction is if we have, for example, this configuration and we have decay, so we have this one that has disappeared, this one has disappeared, and this one has disappeared with some probability, you have decay. And then we have diffusion, just this one is moving to a neighbor. Here I said that we are using a probabilistic cellular automaton. Why? Because this is a probabilistic model. It's not deterministic. And one important thing for this type of models is that the larger the lattice size, the lower the noise. That is, if I consider a lattice size, the state space, the number of grids go to infinity, then I will reproduce the ODE. So the, the ODE is considering that my state space is infinite. If I use a state space of 20 per 20, the dynamics will be very noisy. You will have a lot of fluctuations because of noise. Okay? And this is something that sometimes we use to play with the noise, with, with the, to see the impact of noise. So considering what I've said, to be more precise, if I have a cellular automata with the rules that depend on the neighbors, if I implement the rules without taking into account the neighbors, that is, for example, if I take this cell, there is I1, then I take another random cell, there is I2. With some probability, they produce another I2 and I put it in another random cell. So I break the spatial correlations. If I do this and I use a very large state space, the dynamics will match the ODE perfectly. And it, it, it works. I can say because I, I, I've, I've did it, I've done it, it works. So you, you have the same dynamics. But as space is reduced and local correlations appear, then you have new phenomena. And these new phenomena, for example, here, this is the case for one-dimensional cellular automata. These are very nice simulations. So here you have space, a one-dimensional space. The first row is the initial condition. If I remember, I think you have in gray, you have those cells occupied by I1, and in black, those cells occupied by I1 and I2. Okay. Uh, this is the space. Then you iterate. You build your model. You usually use um, an array, in this case, one dimensional array, where you put your particles. I, I program in C, and sometimes I, I use a structure. So I define a structure of a one dimensional array with two variables in each of the cells. And then you just iterate in time. So for these probabilities, this is a probability of uh, replication, and this is a probability of decay. Without diffusion, you can see that the system at some point um, extincts. It's not able to persist. And this is one of the results that we found, that as you increase diffusion, so diffusion can allow the replicators to persist. And these things about dynamics of cooperation with space and diffusion, 
uh, in the 90s and at the beginning of, of this century, there was a lot of research on this topic because of what I said about the origin of life. The persistence of replicators, the uh, information maintenance, etc. So this is one of results that we found. Okay, let's go for the two-dimensional system. Now I have a lattice, two-dimensional lattice. This is <clears throat> a bifurcation diagram computed with a cellular automata in which for different probabilities of, the, of degradation, I compute the stationary um, population after some transient. And here, what you see is that, well, you start here decreasing, and at some point, you have this jump. This is what statistical physics call it a first-order phase transition. So you have a discontinuous change of state. OK, I know that this is a saddle node bifurcation because I studied the mean field model, and this is a saddle node bifurcation that now is in a special extended system. This is for d equals 0. If you if you see the numbers, this is not so far from the mean field model prediction that was one divided by eight. It's not so far, but when diffusion is one, the critical decay probability moves a little bit to the right, and it's about zero fifteen. Okay, but we have this uh, discontinuous jump. So now I will I will I, I will make you a question. So this is a simulation for the symmetric hypercycle. Here you, here you have the populations of the two replicators, which are overlapped. So here you have a zoom. You can see with the thick line one and with the thin line the other. So they go more or less the same. And these are different snapshots for different time points. And this is the case where we have chosen the value of epsilon more or less here, very close to the transition. Question. What do you think is this so long transient? Then you have the collapse. These are a lot of iterations. These are like, like 7,000 iterations, time iterations, but one time iteration, in one time iteration, I, I choose if the size if one side of the lattice is L cells, so it's L by L, at each time generation, I choose a random cell L squared times. Okay, So this is a, these are a lot of iterations. What do you think is this transient that is so, so, so long? Or what could it be? I am very close to the bifurcation. The ghost. This is, this is the ghost. And I realized 10 years uh, after publishing this work, I realized that this is a ghost. If I make another simulation, probably uh, I would extend here or here or later because you have noise, you are close to a phase transition point, and even some could just be very, very, very long. But this is the, the, the ghost. But, and it's the ghost in a special extended system. Okay. Uh, this is an absorbing first order phase transition. What does it mean? That here, well, I, I can see, I can show you the, the, the movies. This, these are the, the movies of the simu of the previous simulation. Okay. You have I1 and I2. They are um, interacting, reproducing, decaying, and diffusing. Okay, uh, you will see at some point that it's like the, they start appearing some some holes, but then they recover, and at some point you will see that here there are some places that are opening. So so th there is a lack of replicators, and if you remember, they need to be close to each other to replicate. Okay, and you will see that at some point these holes become so large that the system is not able to recover, and then it finally goes to extinction. And it goes to an absorbing state. An absorbing phase transition means that once the system enters into the state, it cannot go out. Okay, because we do not have any kind of entry from outside. So they just become extinct. And, and you will see that 
they more or less follow the same the same patterns. You can see also here the periodic boundary conditions that the ones here appear here and they finally become extinct. Okay. So um, this is a this is a special ghost. Um, I have done a lot of research on this phenomena because it appears in different systems. Uh, we have been interested in what happens in these scaling laws when you have noise. We have identified new scaling laws. And the only work, as far as I know, uh, that has been exploring these special ghosts is a paper that we published uh, this year um, using a similar model to this with a PDE. So we were interested in seeing how a uh, spatial extended system in 1D with a partial differential equation uh, change the properties of these delays and these transients. So if, any, if, if anybody is interested, I can give you more details. Okay, so now a very important part, interactions. Interactions define the dynamics. Then we have different types of interactions. We have density, what we call density independent processes, that these are linear terms in, in the equations or in the processes, and they follow exponential behavior. For example, growth or decay. If alpha is positive, we have exponential growth. If this is the time derivative equal alpha x. And if alpha is negative, we have exponential decay. And then here are uh, interesting things. So when we talk about density dependent processes, um, we have to use nonlinear terms. For example, in chem chemistry or physics or um, chemical physics or f physical uh, chemistry, I don't know. You have this uh, process of nucleation. You have some um, liquid, you have some liquid, and there are some particles, and these particles act as nucleating agents. So if you have particles, the, li the liquid, it's like retained by this nucleation and can grow. And you can have, a, for example, a, a crystal. This is a density-dependent process. Because if you have a, lo a lot of nucleating agents, for example, in the atmosphere, then the formation of clouds will be like more prone, for example. In biology, it's very, it's very easy. In biology, everything is nonlinear. There are no linear things in biology. No, no, no one, anyone. So, for example, competition. Um, this is what I've talked about uh, before. This is a logistic term. This is intraspecific competition and interspecific competition. That is competition between the individuals of the same species or competition between individuals of different species. We also have cooperation or facilitation. We have, for example, for the autocatalytic system, we can have a ribozyme that catalyzes its own reproduction. And we have an autocatal autocatalyst, autocatalyst. So this is just the product x, uh, x per x, so x squared. If we have two species that are cooperating, it's the product x, y, or x, y, x, uh, this is i minus 1. Okay, we have this um, by the law of mass action. We have that the growth is not exponential. Actually, this growth is called hyperbolic. And this is because we have cooperation. Then we have, for example, host parasite dynamics. This is a map. This is a discrete system. And here we have that the parasite grows proportionally to the amount of hosts because the parasite is using the host for the reproduction. And here we have the negative effect of the competition and of the predation with uh, exponentials. Sometimes in the maps, they use exponential functions to have smooth dynamics, okay? because you know discrete systems, solutions jump a lot and you can go from, from one to zero. Uh, so you can go from one to minus one without, without crossing the zero. So they usually use exponentials. Then we have gene regulation. For example, you can have activation of genes or repression of genes, some products that activate the production of some molecule or some molecules that repress 
the synthesis of, of others. And then we have uh, very useful functions that I think are not restricted only to ecology, that are, satu are, are, uh, are satura saturating function. They, they are called functional responses. And these are called usually holding functional responses. So in case of ecology, it's very easy to understand. So the functional response is how changes the intake rate of praise with a number of praise. Because it is associated with what we know as numerical response, that is the reproduction rate of a predator that at the end is the result of eating the praise because the predator needs to obtain energy for reproduction and it obtains it through the praise. So mainly there are three different types. Holling type one, uh, if this is the prey density and this is the number of prey consumed, so the intake rate, the holling type one considers that this is a linear relation. So there is no saturation. The more preys, the more I will eat them and the more I, I will reproduce. This is the what we see in the Lotka Volterra prey predator model. That more or less have this form. Okay. So this is the holling type two. This is the predator. This is the prey. The predator reproduces proportionally to the amount of prey because they are eating the prey and the prey are removed because are eaten by the predator. Okay. And this model, despite it's very simple and very unrealistic, actually give oscillations, the typical prey predator oscillations with the centers. Here we do not have a limit cycle, we have centers. Okay. So, of course, these are models, there are assumptions. So here we assume, uh, we assume a linear increase in intake rate with food density. And this means that the time needed for consumption is negligible. Consumption is automatic. And consumption does not interfere in the search of food. Okay. Uh, this is not a realistic system, but it's giving oscillations, which is quite interesting. Interesting. Holling type two. This is more realistic. And this was studied and introduced in the 60s by Holling. This article is very interesting if you can read it because this guy did some experiments with people searching for stones in the sand. And he was like, in some sense, uh, obtaining this function. So the more stones you had in the sun, in the sun, uh, it doesn't mean that the more you get because you have to look for them, you have to find them. And there was a saturation. At some point, it doesn't matter if there are 100 or 200 stones because you will not find all of them. And this is called the Holling disk equation. Okay. So here, what we assume is that there is a deceleration in the intake of prey as prey density increases. Okay. Why? Because there is a limited cap capacity of process all the all the all this food. And at some point, I, I, I will not be hungry. I will not be continue eating preys. If I'm hungry, I will, I will go to sleep. And here, of course, we consider that we differentiate between the process of searching for food and eating. They are exclusive. You cannot do at the same time. Well, I know a few people that can do it in the, at the same time. I know some people that can do it. And this is the equation. This is, this is very simple. So here, mainly the, for example, this function here, this one, would be this one. So we would have this uh, A, which is the attack rate, the number of times I attack the prey divided by one plus this attack rate. The H is the handling time. Is the time I need to process the prey for eating. So in, in some sense, it, if it decreases, uh, it is like uh, it's making this, uh, this fraction to increase. And then, uh, so 
this now would be this. This term here now would be this. Okay, so the the predation the predator and the x and the prey. And this is a saturating function. Okay, at, at some prey density, I cannot continue eating. This uh this function is very similar to the um enzymatic reactions of the Michaelis Menten equation that you have this uh product um, um you have the formation of this enzyme that is interacting with a product and it's then processing it and this is a Michaelis Menten equation okay attack rate and handling time and finally there is another one that has not been so studied that is this one that is very interesting because here we have the same but x is to the power of k and this means that of course when k is equal to one we have holding type two but here we are assuming that a prey type so a predator needs to interact with the prey many times and the prey type is only accepted after every k encounters and this is related with the process of learning so my first interaction i go to uh, i go to the prey especially the, this happens for the for the babies of, of the young animals i go to the prey i interact with with the prey but i i don't know how to catch it i don't know if i have to go for the other side i don't know if i can just jump to the neck and then you need several iterations and actually you have like this slowdown here okay and this one is, is very interesting because it's related with the behavior with animal behavior and i've seen very few models with this with this one Okay, I think 10 minutes more and you are free. Okay, go, go, going back to the to the finite systems. So nothing can grow indefinitely, this for sure. This is the the logistic equation in time continuous uh, in a time continuous model. And again, here the, the the idea is that the size of the population is slowing down the uh, growth rate okay this is the meaning of this equation so um this is what i was telling before this so here you can see that one equilibrium point is zero and the other is k it's the carrying capacity so when the, the the system arrives to the carrying capacity this is one this cancels and the time derivative is zero equilibrium point okay so examples of logistic growth in real data a lot a lot so here i just put two which are very classic actually uh one is from 1932 by gauss which uh is, was a very important scientist in ecology that just fitted this equation to this population growing in test tubes then also with experiments on on daphnia daphnia are like very tiny crustaceans that that uh now I don't remember if they yeah I think they they live in the in the sea or or in in, in lakes I don't remember well it's a very a very small crustacean and with some experiments also uh, this uh, this also found that the their growth have a logistic and and then just for you to see that there are a lot of examples these are three works uh, done by, my, by myself and other colleagues and the ampli amplification of virus viral RNA RNA in a cell. It also follows a logistic um, model. Also, uh, viruses infecting a plant. Different viruses infecting a plant and and uh, uh, replicating inside the plant. They also follow a logistic model. And also the example of the birds. The first period is a, log a perfect logistic uh, dynamics. No, the first period is that uh, before the arrival of predators, we had we had this growth, and then the arrival of predators just changed everything. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Of the yeah of the of the birds. Yeah. Okay, and in interspecific competition, this is the famous Lotka Volterra competition model, in which we have two species. This is the carrying capacity. Usually we have one here, and then we have this two divided by K1, but it doesn't matter. This is the carrying capacity, K1, carrying capacity K2. 
And um, these are the alpha and beta are the um, competition strength or the competition parameters. Here, just one thing. I don't know if you have heard about the competitive exclusion principle, which is a very important principle in ecology. And this is called also Gauss's principle. And this principle is very easy to see with these equations. So if alpha and beta are one, so here alpha and beta are one, uh, these two species can only coexist when R1 and R2 are the same. There is an interior equilibrium point that is only stable when these two are the same. This means that the same species have the same fitness. But if any of the two species, and this is what the Gauss principle say, or the competitive exclusion principle says, if you have two species competing for the same resources, the species with the higher fitness will outcompete the other one. And this is the competitive exclusion principle, Gauss principle, and was stated by, by Gauss. Okay? This is a, a very fundamental principle in, in ecology. Okay, so I've talked about the logistic constraint, uh, but there are other ways we can uh, bound the growth of a system. And one is the constant population constraint. This is another way we can do it. Depending on the system, it's better to use the logistic function or this one. And now I, I, will, I will give you an example. So this is one of the simplest models for studying the dynamics of a uh, virus, of the genomes of a virus. So imagine, this is capital M, this is what we call the master sequence. So this is a virus, a wild type virus, that has a genome with all the information encoded. And this virus, when infects a cell, can suffer mutations, and these mutations give place to mutant genomes. And we assume that these mutant genomes are grouped all together in this variable xm small m, and they are produced at a given mutation rate. So the reproduction of the master genome will be those genomes that are not mutating, so one minus mu, this is the, reprodu the reproduction, the production rate. And then, of course, for the mutants, we will have those mutants coming from the master, that will be mu fm xm, this is the production of mutants, and the replication of the mutants, because they also replicate. But we assume that they replicate at a lower rate, because they are mutants and more... Mm, Typically, when you have mutations in a virus, they decrease the fitness. Very simple model. This is the, uh, it's called quasi-species model. Okay. This so simple equation has put to the light very relevant phenomena that have been found in real viruses. But I will not enter into details. So when we have the constant population, uh, mainly what we have is that we have a, a, a chemostat, so we have a, a tank, which is mixed. Our species are here inside, interacting, reproducing, decaying, and we have some constant input of nutrients, and we have an outflow term. This is, this is a real system. This is a, a chemical system that, that uh, some people that is um, working with yeast or with bacteria, they have this kind of tanks and they have a constant population. So this keeps the population constant. And from a mathematical point of view, it means that we have that xm plus xm, this is constant. Okay, an assumption. I am here inside. I am receiving nutrients and I am uh, throwing away all what I have to throw away to keep it constant. 
So if this is constant, the sum of the time derivatives, this is zero. Usually put it to one. So if you want to make a model like this, it's very easy. You need to put exam. Here I put all the dynamics. And here, the other dynamics. For example, replication, mutation, whatever. Okay, this is the dynamics. But then, to have to, to, to fulfill these conditions, I need to put here minus the variable multiplying by this outflow term. And here, the same. But then I have to compute this thing in order to ensure the constant population. So it's very easy. For that model, I have uh, 1 minus mu f m x m minus x m this okay plus mu f m x m plus f m x m minus x m equals zero Okay, I put this here outside. Uh, if you if you make this sum, this here cancels with this. Okay, and then I have this. Okay. This is one. This is one. Then I have pi is this term. And this is usually the fitness of the of the variables. So if then I take this phi and I put it here, so minus xm multiplied by f m x m plus f little m x m and here the same if you if you make calculations you make simulations you will see that the population is constant the only thing is that things move from here to here okay and another interesting thing is that when i use the constant population constraint uh, i can reduce the dimension of the system because I have a linear relation between the variables. And I can work with a single equation because I can say that xm is 1 minus xm. And then I can put this one here and work with a single equation. Because since the population is constant, if I have the value of xm, I automatically have the value of the other one. This is very powerful because it allows to simplify the model, at least one degree of freedom. And this constant population usually is used in models in epidem epidemiology, when you have different compartments and you have transitions between co compartments. So if you consider all the, the population of all the compartments, this is constant. You, you only have changes. And this is very powerful. This is a very powerful um, approach and it's very easy you only need to add the outflow term and then to compute the the phi with the with the sum of the time derivatives you always have this term outside and then you can you can just uh... okay and just to finish this is a summary of all the models that we can use and how are these models? For example, dynamical system. We have what kind of variables we have if, if they are uh, real value functions or the, they are continuous, if the time is continuous. What are the dimensions, but in terms of a dynamical system? Okay, so if we have 
Um, so let's say that the, if you have ordinary differential equations and you have three ODEs, then dimension is three, for example. And then we have the spatial dimensions, if they are sp spatial extended systems or not, or models. So for example, for uh, autonomous ODEs, they are state, the uh, state variables are continuous, time is continuous, the dynamical dimension is the number of variables, and no spatial dimensions. This is a well-mixed system. Non-autonomous ODEs, in which we have that parameters depend on time explicitly, it's the same, but the dimensions, we, ne we need to add time. For example, interesting, for delay differential equations or partial differential equations, the dynamical dimensions are infinite. Okay? Delay differential equations, they are well mixed. There is no space, although we can also have mm, delay differential equations with partial delay differential equations. And here you have space. And then we have the discrete systems that are mainly agent-based modeling, cellular automata, and as we will see in the next session, the couple map lattices that are discrete in time, but continuous in state variable. Okay. And these are the, the dynamical dimension. The dynamical dimension is very important because, as I explained at the beginning, it can give clues about the possible dynamics that we can observe. For example, one, one known effect of space is that if you have a periodic orbit, you have an ODE system with a periodic orbit, and then you take this model and you build a PDE model, the inclusion of space and diffusion can make these periodic orbits unstable and you can have a chaotic strange attractor, for example. And this is what is called diffusion-induced chaos. And this is one example of the role of space. Okay. Good. So for today, I think it's enough. And uh, the next session, I will I will enter in more detail about metapopulation models, cellular automata. I will put some other examples, and I will explain these two approaches to data: qualitative and quantitative. Okay. Uh, if you have any question, any comment. If you go to my website, you can see there the, all these works that more or less are published, and there you have more details. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.